right, hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm joined by Alessandra Wall, who is also in San Diego. How are you doing, Alessandra? I'm doing fantastic. How are you? I'm doing great. And, and Alessandra helps women craft deeply satisfying careers and teaches companies how to ret retain and attract exceptional women. It's easy for me to say. And um, uh, what we're going to talk about today is women speaking up or navigating burnout and pushback in the workplace. Uh, so, uh, Alessandra, tell me why, first start, why do you focus in on this particular area of of helping you know, women uh, you know, have the best careers they can and also helping companies attract and retain um, the best women? And what are some of the differences that they have to do, changes they have to make in order to do this? You're going to help me remember all of those questions, yeah. right? Okay. I was like so to ask a 52-part question to begin with. <laughs> to answer the first question, my background is as a clinical psychologist. Mm -hmm. so the first um, decade plus of my career was spent working with a variety of people, but a lot of them were women who were coming in and I specialize at this point in anxiety and burnout and stress management. Um, and so in that capacity, just even as a psychologist, a lot of trying to understand why the, the patients that were seeing were burning out, why they weren't doing well, um, led to the realization that a lot of times there are things that affect us women in particular that we don't address very well or at all. Um, and in not addressing them, there are a lot of social rules that we're trying to follow, but those social rules ultimately lead to our breakdown. Fast forward a little bit, and I built a coaching, uh, a coaching practice, uh, which is now my primary business. I still see patients, but coaching and consulting is, is, where, is what I love to do. Mm -hmm. And um, I was, again, working a lot with professional women who were either leaving their their companies or, or exiting their careers entirely because of burnout. And again, a lot of what I realized is that these women were not actually articulating to anybody at work why they were leaving, or if they did, they would do it once or twice. And when they wouldn't receive um, any like validation or positive response on their request, would stop. Mm -hmm. um, so, did you did you find yeah did you find that there were particular there were particular things that are more prevalent to women that was con contributing towards the burnout? Um, yes, there are a couple things. So I would say a lot of it has to do with how we're socialized, and when I say we, I mean men and women alike. Mm -hmm. uh, from the time girls are in diapers, we are told that we need to be a lot of things. So we need to be nice and helpful and collaborative. And um, we need to be kind and we need to share and we need to be humble. And all of those are fantastic qualities for any human being to have. However, when they're pushed to an extreme and, they're, and, and they're, they're expressed in a professional setting, what that really leads to is nice becomes, I'll do everything everybody asks me without setting limits. And I won't speak up for myself on the off chance that it might upset somebody, might position me ahead of someone else. Humble translates into, I'm not going to articulate clearly what it is I do really, really well. And I'm not going to always speak up very well about the impact that I personally have had on a certain project or, or a team, because mm -hmm. that would be boastful. Um, trying to be kind gets used a lot as a team player. I don't know, have you ever seen Nine to Five, the movie? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So I don't know if you we're, da this. we're dating ourselves here, but yeah, I've that's seen okay. It. It's a fantastic movie. I recommend it to all my millennials and Gen Zers. I tell them go watch it. It's a great movie. There's a scene where Lily Tomlin's boss is trying to convince her. Um, he wants to go buy a scarf. And he's saying it's for his wife, but really it's for uh, Dolly Parton, who's one of these secretaries that he's hoping he can have an affair with, and she wants nothing to yeah. do with it. And Lily Tomlin is desperately trying to set limits. And she's like, this is not my job. She's his executive assistant, basically. She's like, mm -hmm. this is not what I do. And he's giving her this whole talk on being a team player. And he goes, well, look at that. The second I asked you to help, you just gave up on, you're saying no to being a team player, right? Yeah. That idea yeah. of being helpful and supportive can really get warped either because 
you have people who are warping it or just because we are not really good at saying, I'm sorry, I'm overbooked, overtaxed, I can't participate in that, I'm not the best person for that. And so those I think are um, circumstances that although they might happen across all gender spectrums, sure. are especially pervasive for women. Mm -hmm. And then, so when you work with organizations, and this is probably, there's probably a lot of this goes on, right? It, somewhat unconsciously, right? I mean, it's not, um, and, and yes, you would think nowadays that, you know, hopefully people would be a little bit smarter than thinking that, you know, when, in, in recognizing what is a work related issue and what's a personal issue and all that kind of stuff. But how do you help companies then? Because, um, like I said, a lot of this stuff may be unconscious and may even be, uh, unrecognizable for the untrained eye. There, so there are, there are a couple of things. This is where I would say I draw a fair bit from my background as a psychologist. Mm -hmm. So my experience, and in San Diego, I, I move in the diversity, equity, inclusion space. My experience mm -hmm. is that we're really good about talking about theoretical models and theoretical practices that um, would be fantastic. I mean, they would work so well if you had very self-aware people who were really good at managing their own distress and discomfort and would take action mm -hmm. and, and knew exactly what, what action to take. The reality for most of us as human beings is we go about our business bumbling around most days, me, including myself, right? Uh, we're only self-aware to a certain point. That's why other people are better than us at kind of identifying our patterns and the mistakes we might make and also our, our strengths at times. And human beings by nature hate feeling uncomfortable. So we will naturally avoid anything that makes us feel bad, feel bad about ourselves, feel bad mm -hmm. about a situation. So part of the work I try to do with companies is to come in and say, listen, we have these theoretical models that don't really apply in the real world unless we are putting in place systems to practice this stuff again and again and again. And unless we're being realistic about how hard it is to do this stuff, think about your average unconscious bias training. It comes in, it tells a group of people, hey, just so you know, you're, you're not as open-minded and as unbiased as you think you are. And here are all the biases you have. Good luck, now you know you're aware, change it. Mm -hmm. The reality is because they're unconscious and because we have the men and women, do exactly the same thing. So a lot of it is coming in and trying to talk to companies about, well, how do we help your people notice it? How do we pair people up so that they can buddy, so that that awareness and objectivity we have about somebody else that we can't have about ourselves is used uh, in the right ways? Mm -hmm. And how do you train people to deal with the fact that it's really, really uncomfortable to realize that even women, right? When I talk to women, this is um. This is something I try to remind, remind them. I'm trying not to create an us versus them, male versus female yeah, thing no, going no, on. But that women are just as bad as men at applying these unconscious biases bias mm -hmm. against other women. So um, when, when we realize that we get very defensive and we shut down, part of it is saying, okay, well, what do you do once you notice it? You're going to feel uncomfortable. You're going to feel guilty. You mm -hmm. might even feel some shame. Let's move beyond that and do something. Um, so the, so the goal is to come in and really be realistic about how humans operate and yeah. just theoretical. Yeah, no, I, I like that because sometimes this stuff seems a little bit sledgehammery, you know, to be honest. And, and, and I don't think you get very far often from, you know, the ones that come in and basically say, here's all the things wrong with you, right? Here's a big long yeah. list of all the things. And it's wrong with all of you, by the way, right? Yeah. It's not, um, and and as you say, I mean, naturally, people get very defensive in, uh, in situations like that. Or, or anyway, it can go a number of different ways. But I like what you're saying about the idea of, of being realistic, but also being quite, um, I mean, quite targeted in your approach. Mm -hmm. One of the things I always try to do, so I'm, uh, I love public speaking and training, and I get to do it uh, quite a bit. So one of my goals at the end is always to have people think of one situation or one person or one dynamic that applies to whatever we've been talking about and just to commit to practicing whatever we've been discussing in that space. So when I teach unconscious bias and I have a room full of men and women, we'll start and all the women will be nodding their heads and, and I'll turn on the women and I'll say, listen, you know what sucks more than the fact that men do this is that you do it to each other. So mm -hmm. start thinking about one woman you work with 
who you have used all these labels or attitudes that we just discussed toward. And I want you to start thinking about what that feels like for her and how your actions are impacting her, her sense of fulfillment, her ability to do her job, right? All those things. And then I want you to think about what you're going to do the next time you start thinking, acting, or operating in this way and, and, and really have them think about it. Because if you can start with one person, that's building the self-awareness, mm -hmm. right? Instead of saying, I need you to pay attention to how you're treating every woman, every man, right? I mean, men, men face their fair share of unconscious biases too. Sure. So. Yeah, no, they, they do. And I think, uh, and I think it's gotten a very confused place, to be honest, because I think people have been so kind of bombarded that they're not really sure which way to, to turn right now. And, mm -hmm. and I think that, yeah, I mean, I like what you're, uh, you're, as I said, I like your approach because one of the other things is that I always say is that, you know, is that, you know, change comes about in the small things in your orbit, right, that you implement mm -hmm. within your orbit, you know, those small changes, and they accumulate over time, as opposed to, as you said at the beginning, like coming in with grand theoretical frameworks and saying we're going to change the whole world and workplace by this it doesn't it doesn't work like that the 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 more community if you like almost individual base sorry based i'm in the approach. middle of an interview that <laughs> that's is fine the that's that. perfect <laughs> it's perfect no we like we like reality here but you know what I mean? Like instead of these big blanket things is coming into it in a much more, I, I like the practical approach, as you say, like that's one thing, like wh how is, how, how would you react differently to one person or treat one person differently? I mean, I think that mm -hmm. is just so much more powerful. Yeah. And, and, and it's doable, right? So the second it becomes mm -hmm. yeah. doable, then people will start making that effort. This, this, the other piece is when you're talking about something global like that, yeah. it's about making it human and, and personal. It has to matter mm -hmm. to you. So if we just yeah. talk theoretically, you might feel bad for five minutes or might be shocked or whatever, but, um, but we can't, we're not going to care enough to change. If, however, you make it personal, yeah. then suddenly, then suddenly, you're actually going to care about the other human beings. And, you know, you were asking earlier, like, what do I do to help companies, yeah. help women? Part of it, part of the reason I shifted from working just with women in coaching to trying to engage corporations is that I was sending women back into the workplace who were more sort of more outspoken, had better boundaries and limits. And what they were being met with was a whole bunch of labels, aggressive, uh, unfriendly. There's some other ones that we won't put, so you don't have to label this in an explicit episode. <laughs> um, but and and so what that led to is they would either still need to leave the organizations they were in because the way they operated was far more likely to lead to success in the long run, especially you know success and satisfaction, mm -hmm. as opposed to success at the cost of your own well-being, fulfillment, all those things. And then um, it's, a, it's a full house of living things in here. Um, and then the other thing is I was speaking to a lot of leaders who did not realize how many of their top level women who they'd been grooming or really looking up to were actually preparing to leave companies. Mm -hmm. right? Um, yeah, that, that, that's that's that, I guess that that's that's fascinating um, in that way because I mean you do I mean to in your point here saying like there's people they looked up to or they thought were impressive and are really getting on and those people were preparing to leave. So what was the disc? What was the? I'd be interested in that. What was the disconnect there between you know somebody who people were looking up to and thought they really have it together and they're forging ahead and they're great, but in reality they're having probably an entirely different experience. Well, so this as women is, I think, where we have ownership. This is where the disconnect is. If you're my boss mm -hmm. and you ask me if I'll do this, if I'll do that, if I'll take care of this project, and I'm constantly saying, yes, of course, yes, of course, I'll do it, John, you know, I've got this. And um, I am never voicing to you that you have just asked me to do a completely different job, that the job you're asking me to do doesn't fall within my purview, that mm -hmm. um, I am so overwhelmed or that I'm carrying my team, how are you to know, right? So on the surface, I call this the Wonder yeah. Woman effect, right? On the surface, yeah. I look like Wonder Woman. I can handle everything. 
behind all of that, I'm slowly burning up. I'm slowly just breaking down. As a psychologist, I would see people, you know, who sometimes had to take full leaves of absence because of the levels right. of anxiety and stress in their life. Good thing I catch it earlier, and hopefully if we can work with organizations, we can catch it even before it becomes a problem. But I think that's, that's where we, as women, need to take ownership instead of just pointing the finger and saying, they, they, mm -hmm. they, they, they. Yeah, yeah, because I mean, I'm sure you've seen a lot of situations then that it kind of took took everybody so by surprise when the the person said, "Well, I'm leaving or I'm burnt out or you know I'm not happy here." No, like, no. Oh. And I guess the first thing is people say, "But well, why didn't you say something?" Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And and I used to say when I started, you know, the exit interview is the only time you're going to hear about it. And then I realized actually you don't because these women are smart and they're driven and they're ambitious and they're not going to burn bridges during their exit interview no. by being clear about why they left. So there's also very little, for a company that actually genuinely does something with the exit interview, there is at that point still very little opportunity to get information that's useful. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm not, a, I'm not a big believer in the exit interviews. As you say, you're either going to get, you're either going to get a, a pretty neutral, thing you're going to get somebody who's happy they're leaving they're just moving on to better opportunity or you're going to get somebody who's disgruntled and doesn't understand the concept of burning bridges <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> but generally yeah. speaking i don't think you get anything particularly useful out of it i mean that's why i'm i don't even like the whole once a year like performance reviews and all of that because i think that's something that you should be doing on an ongoing basis right if you're working with people you should be pretty much knowing how they're doing and helping them like on a daily basis as opposed to having just a sit down once a year um so what else what else what else could you say to help um, um what are some of the what are some of the key things that you think as men like I'll, I'll represent all men for a moment and what do we as men what are some simple things that we overlook or maybe uh, do or don't do today in relation to our female colleagues that if we pay just attention to just this one or two things that we could make an impact immediately Maybe not a huge impact, but at least, an, at least a start. Oh, I actually think the two things I'm going to mention, I might throw in a third, I would make huge impacts. And I will add, I recognize that they're completely difficult to do. Mm -hmm. So the first one I would say is be very mindful of how many things are being tasked to the women on your team or in your group versus the men. Right. And I do not believe that men are out to get women. I do not believe that they are just trying to take advantage of us and not... I'm in a household where I'm the only woman. Um, even the nanny's a man. Um, <laughs> and gosh, that gentleman helps me so much. Um, but uh, I do think it just happens by default because that's what our moms did, because that's what our grandmothers did, because if you have a daughter in the house, chances are she's the one who's being asked to help, you know, set the table, do things, right? We, we default. I'm not even assuming I would be better at this. Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes, especially as leaders, but even as members in a group, to kind of just sit back and look at, you know, is, is Alessandra on this team? Is she constantly being asked to do these little things? Yeah. Um, the second thing would be, so there are three. The second thing I would add, which is also difficult, but not impossible, is watch how often women get interrupted when they speak or asked to justify their position when they speak. Mm. That believe it or not, has an incredibly huge impact on satisfaction and engagement. But it's also, I spoke to a CEO at one of the tech companies here months, like at the beginning of the pandemic, and he's like, women use so many more words than men. And I said, yes. And at the time I was kind of taken aback by what he said. And mm -hmm. I wish I had stopped and said, because we're asked to justify all the time, right? So if you were to say, you know, Sales pop is amazing. People will be like, oh my goodness, sales pop is amazing. <laughs> I say sales pop is amazing. And I'm asked, well, what makes sales pop amazing? <laughs> right? I have to, I have to, right? So then I start talking. I'm told I use too much words, but I'm interrupted. That would be the next one. Right. Um, it, and it hap it's so stereotypical, but I cannot tell you how many women I work with who will say, I can't, I can't talk in a meeting. I can't. Like, I can't get a word in edgewise, I can't explain. And the third one, which is probably the easiest of the three things, is go ask the women on your, that you work with how you can support them. What is one thing that you could do that would help them feel 
more valued, more engaged, less burdened, and ask them to give you just one thing that's, that's truly actionable and then follow through on that. Right. No, I think I think that's a great. Those are those are those are great um, great ones because they're simple, as you said, and, and actionable. I love that idea of um, of making sure that you don't interrupt. Because yeah, I mean, especially when you get a bunch of uh, Type A personalities, um, you know, that you tend to have on senior teams and stuff like that is, you know, we're all very good at interrupting each other. And perhaps, and perhaps that's something that maybe uh, everybody's watching and listening. Maybe we need to wa take a, a conscious look at and see whether we actually interrupt women more than we interrupt other, you know, fellow men. So that's a good and and like you said, is the um, is is justifying things. Um, uh, that's another that's another good one for people to take away. You know, do we ask women to justify their positions on things more so? Do we drill down further than we would? normally with the man and then the, what, what you said about just asking you know what we can do to help on you know to help on burdens um somebody i think those are those are three very practical takeaways here that's i don't think it's going to overburden any of our any other men <laughs> listening here to take those three things on board i would start with number three and i'll say this so i grew yeah. up in france i am of a i am a, the descendant of italian immigrants to france Mm -hmm. um we interrupt each other all the time that's sure. how we speak right a conversation around the table is you speak i speak over you speak that's not the way things happen in america um it's not the way things happen in the uk it's not the way things happen in germany or in the netherlands and so you can learn to change i had to learn to change yeah. Yeah. Europe, it is Asia, it is what happens over yeah. each other yeah, no, it is what it does happen in Ireland. We we do talk over each other kind of quite. It's so much more Gaelic. It's the it's the Gaelic piece. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's our Celtic kind of you know whatever. No. We're, we're, yeah, that's what I was saying. You know, we we can argue with ourselves. So you know, we can interrupt ourselves, which is even a greater talent. Um, but listen, this is fantastic, Alessandra. Thank you so much for this. We're just coming up against the end of our time, but there were some real practical nuggets in there. And I think a lot of, I mean, let me go back to one thing you mentioned earlier about awareness and self-awareness. And I, and I think that's such a, such a, a critical point because it is the one thing that will not just liberate yourself, but it will impact those around you is if you spend a little time working on actually knowing yourself a little bit better and self, you know, going on a journey of self-awareness, you know, it may be not always the most pleasant thing to do, but it's so rewarding. It is. And again, I would say start with number three, just ask a woman mm. you care about in your, in your space. It could be your, your spouse. It could be a neighbor, your daughter, somebody you actually work with. What's one thing I can do? to actually support you or mm -hmm. to help you or to, you know, to, to be an ally, right? This word ally and, and yeah. have them give you one thing and just focus on that person and that one thing. That's it. That's yeah. enough. It's fantastic. Listen, Alessandra, this is great. And like I said, I love your approach. I love the, 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 everything you've outlined here, because for me, it's so practical and targeted as opposed to being, like I said, a sledgehammer which sometimes we we see in these circumstances um all of alessandra's information is going to be below the video here but um before you go please do tell people a little bit more about yourself and what you do um so my name is dr alessandra wall i am many things but what i do is that i help professional women build deeply satisfying careers and i try to support the companies that are trying to hire and retain these women do just that excellent all right, my name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, and Pipeliner CRM. I will see you all for another expert interview really soon. Thank you. Thank you, John.